This is Wakia in the spirit of Geronimo Crazy Horse. Thought I'd add Geronimo to that mix today because we're going to talk about, and I might include that permanently. Thunder's going to wax on and wax off about warrior spirits and energies and my favorite topics that I've waxed on <laughs> before, but it never gets old to me. And just, it keeps coming to me, this uh, wanting to talk about, tell stories. I'm going to tell some stories today about great warriors, since there's such a lack of them now. <laughs> in our society. I mean, great warriors. You know, I think about people like Goyathle, one who yawns, which was Geronimo's real name. And I think about Crazy Horse, Tosunke Witko uh, was his real name. Uh, actually, his real name was Gigi light-haired one, but people got to calling him Crazy Horse. And the reason that they did is because that was the name of his horse, or that's the, <laughs> that's the, uh, that's the uh, definition that they put on his horse. His horse was crazy, okay. So when they'd talk about Crazy Horse, they'd say, you know, that guy over there whose horse is crazy? And that's how Crazy Horse got his name Crazy Horse. His real name was Tosunke Witko, which means his horse is crazy, or Gigi. So thinking about, I was thinking about where Geronimo might have got that name, one who yawns. <laughs> um, what a great, great character, warrior. Uh, <clears throat> I was thinking the other day that he probably got that name because he probably sat around and if people were, were talking or jabbering about anything else other than being a strong warrior, he would probably go, oh, okay, yeah, tell me about it, whatever. <laughs> because his mind was on the warrior path strongly. And I, I often think about the different warriors of different tribes, like, uh, and the different chiefs that were warriors. Chief, Chief Joseph, whose name was Thunder Rolling Down Off the Mountain. A whole, there's a whole Thunder Clan lineage of people with the name Thunder, or Thunder in their name. In fact, Crazy Horse was a thunder dreamer, a heyoka, one who does things contrary to what people expect. And I think about um, those two. Let's take Geronimo and Crazy Horse, and I, I look at them equally with uh, admiration, admiration and pride that they were indigenous people of this land and that they, they had a certain mindset and they were both very, very spiritual, okay? They were out there where people don't even know about <laughs> in this, this society that we live in now. They're, they were out in the clouds. They were out with mafia, the clouds. and. Uh, I often look at Geronimo as a little bit more yang, almost like the yin and yang. You have Crazy Horse, which is a little bit more on the yin side, and Geronimo, which is, he was basically pretty much <laughs> yang oriented as far as aggressiveness, okay, and warriorship. But does that mean Crazy Horse was any less the warrior? No, he was just as much of a warrior. His ways were s more subtle, okay. Crazy Horse would go out and find a mound somewhere or a place where he could overlook the vista of the plains 
or the forestry or wherever he was at that time, he would disappear for months. He would disappear for months and nobody would even know where he was. And where he was was out meditating and seeking visions on these sacred mounds in the Dakota Territory. And then you had, you had Geronimo who had his powers. See, all, all of these warriors had power. They weren't just warriors, they were medicine men, they were shaman, they were in that ilk, okay. Now, Geronimo got his power from Usen or Usen, and um, it was called the Da Gehogate, which is the power. And Lozen had this power, the woman Apache warrior, which is available to those of us who want to tap into it. And I tap into it. It's awesome. Okay. It's a spirit, and when you're talking about when you're talking about these kind of people like Goyafle and Tusunke Witko, uh, you are talking about a spirit. Okay, that's why I say in the spirit of Crazy Horse or in Geronimo and Crazy Horse's spirit, because that spirit is all pervading and it's with us. Never, it never, uh, it just changes form. Okay. And both of these guys were uh, pretty kick-ass. Uh, they didn't take shit. They didn't take any, you know, they, they didn't. Uh, I was trying to imagine, uh, I was trying to imagine the other day, uh, here I am sitting before a computer and I was trying to imagine interviewing Geronimo and Crazy Horse, what a laugh. Come right over here to the computer, sit down and can I talk to you? No, uh, I don't think that would work. So I will just channel their energy is what I'll do. Um, now, lots of things happen with these guys that, and you know, I want to throw Sitting Bull into the mix too. Man, there's just so many warriors. I mean, if I had to, if I had to pick a favorite warrior, a favorite brave, it's funny they associate that name brave with warrior, brave meaning courage. Uh, there's a severe lack of courage in our society today. You're not going to find anything like Crazy Horse or uh, Geronimo Spirit, with exception to yours truly. <laughs> uh, too many places. I see it in others, though. It's a spirit, okay? And it, you have to have that spirit. Now, you know, uh, there was a time. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about Geronimo, and let's talk about how he was on the res from time to time, and then he just split the scene. He split the scene much like Crazy Horse split. He would just take a few people with him and go off to the hills, the Dragoon Mountains in Southwest Arizona, or somewhere near the Mexican border. Uh, speaking of the Mexican border, it brings up another warrior. Man, I just can't can't get enough of these warriors here that and their energy. Uh, I live by it. You have the Apache kid uh, who was just they just called him Kid, but he was, and that's what I'm going to call him today, out of reverence, Kid. Uh, He was, uh, he was cut from uh, the same cloth of these other people, in, but he was like a super chameleon. He was a stealth, uh, covert person that could blend in with anybody. He could dress Navajo, he could dress like a white man, he could dress and blend in with them, and they would just think that he was Mexican or something else. Little did they know that he was a hardcore Apache. I think about some of the escapades of these people like Geronimo and Apache Kid and Crazy Horse. Uh, I think about them in today's setting a lot and I think about their energy which gives me strength. 
There was a story about uh, Geronimo and uh, Goyafle Geronimo, who was uh, near the San Carlos Reservation at one time. He was told to go there and he went there and he kind of surrendered. He surrendered a bunch of times on his own. They never really caught him. If he didn't want to be caught, they didn't catch him. He was a super guerrilla fighter. I think he just surrendered so he could come in and check shit out and see what was going on with the Reds and his people. One time that he did that, he was like kicking back and uh, trying to be peaceful, he even did a little farming and he was out uh, with some other people at a river in uh, Arizona, near a river, and they were communing with their medicine man, Dreamer. Dreamer was somebody that the Blue Coats considered a threat because he, you know, the Blue Coats and the Wide Eyes, they were really like paranoid all the time. They were super fearful of the Apache or any native person because they knew that they had power. But anyway, uh, I have little flashes sometimes of what went down at uh, Sibiku, which is where the Dreamer was and where this particular incident happened, incident at Sibiku. And uh, like I say, the Blue Coats got wind of this Dreamer out there holding little ceremonies and stuff like that. And so they went out there and uh, tried to arrest Dreamer. They were told to arrest Dreamer because he was an upstart and he was causing people to think in certain ways they didn't like. Kind of like today, isn't it? <clears throat> Excuse me. Thinking in certain ways that the powers to be don't like. That they consider a threat that might incite the people to their true spirit of freedom. Free like the wind. So they went out with the purpose of killing or arresting uh, Dreamer, and Dreamer wouldn't have any part of it. He told him to leave, basically. Get the hell out of here. You're interrupting our service. <laughs> you're, you're interrupting our spiritual meeting. So what did they do? They shot him. They, they ended up shooting him and then decapitating him on top of it, okay? And Geronimo was there and he observed the whole thing. He tried to stop it. As soon as they, now they thought they were gonna subdue Dreamer by, by killing him. And you can't subdue a medicine man of that stature by killing him. So his spirit, Dreamer's spirit, exploded into a million different pieces and went out and inhabited or uh, took over or urged on or whatever, all the braves there, Geronimo and everybody just totally received that energy of defiance and freedom and they all flipped out. It was called Incident at Sibiku and they, even, the, even the, uh, the scouts that worked for the Blue Coats immediately turned against the Blue Coats. It was phenomenal. People don't really know what happened, but that's what happened. That's what I've been told by insight is that when Dreamer's, Dreamer was killed, his spirit just exploded into a million different pieces and inhabited all these people and got them to turn on the blue coats. Boom. <laughs> like that. And it ended up where Geronimo took off and took a band of people with him, took a bunch of people with him and split the scene. And uh, Al Sieber, who was head of chief chief of scouts then, who also was the mentor of Apache Kid for a while. He, he got shot and uh, he got wounded. Um, now, it, you know, eventually they, th these, these scouts that worked for the Blue Coats that turned against them, they got hung, okay, for their, uh, what they called uh, treason. But they didn't get Geronimo and they didn't get, he just took off. So that was an incident at Civic U. I wanted to tell you a little bit about that incident. And he, they didn't catch him. He went off into the hills, Geronimo did. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, that was a classic 
battle incident that just happened in the spur of the moment, um, in a flash. Now let's talk about, oh, let's see, I love these stories. Uh, let's talk about Crazy Horse's incident at the, uh, with the Fetterman massacre. Uh, Crazy Horse was hanging around the F Fort Fetterman uh, and there was, uh, I'm not sure if it was Fort Fetterman, anyway. <laughs> Uh, we won't get into specifics as far as fort names right now. Thunder uh, just lets it flow. It'll come to me. But anyway, the, there was a fort, and there it was called the Fetterman Massacre, and uh, it could have been Captain Fetterman, I think it might have been, was in this fort, and uh, the Lakota in Crazy Horse and a bunch of uh, braves from that uh, tribe were hanging out and noticing that these white eyes were coming in and, and trashing everything and taking over land and it was it was a flashpoint okay that'll go down in history a uh, hundred in the hand was the name of the war or that clash a hundred in the hand and the reason it was called that was because this Captain Fetterman, that's what it was, Captain Fetterman uh, was anti, he was racist. He was anti-red man and he wanted to kill every red man he could. He wanted to make a name for himself. Little did he know that Crazy Horse Tosunke Witko and a bunch of other people uh, had a little plan for them to lure them out and take care of business, uh, get rid of some of them. And so they waited till the wood choppers came out from the fort and they did this kind of like mock attack where they didn't really kill everybody. I don't, I don't know if they killed anybody. Their whole purpose was to send these wood choppers back to the fort and complaining and whining and crying about how they got attacked by the Sioux. And, of course, Fetterman, trying to make a name for himself, immediately got a platoon together or whatever. About a hundred people, I think. That's what it was called, hundred in the hand. And he proceeded to ask the uh, commanding officer of the fort to go out, request permission to go out and chase the hostiles, the savages. And that's exactly what Crazy Horse and the rest of the crew wanted. They were super tacticians, trust me. And so what happened was is that Fetterman uh, received orders that he was to go out and pursue the hostiles, but not to go out beyond a certain ridge, not to go out too far, okay. And Crazy Horse probably knew of this, this that he would receive this command, and so they had a, a way pre-planned to lure them out. So they, Captain Fetterman went out with his troops, you know, and they went out there after the, the Sioux and they start, they saw him off in the distance. The Sioux stayed a good distance away, but they made, made themselves, they showed themselves. So Fetterman pursued them and they, they kept withdrawing further and further and further and he pursued them farther and farther till he was getting to that point where the commanding officer said, no, don't go beyond that point. And this is exactly the, the time when Crazy Horse uh, baited him big time. He got off his, they were shooting at the Sioux and he got to within shooting range, okay? And trusted in great spirit that no bullets would hit him. And they didn't and they went zinging by his head and he got off his horse real nonchalantly just to piss Fetterman off and pretended like he was uh, checking his uh, horse's uh, hooves or whatever he was messing around with his horse just nonchalant or his saddle he was just messing around like 
the white eyes didn't even exist. The, the blue coats didn't even exist, and they were incredulous. They were going, look at that. He's just, they got so upset, Fetterman did, that he disregarded orders and ordered his men to pursue Crazy Horse, and Crazy Horse trotted off, got on his horse, and just kind of nonchalantly trotted off into this ravine. <laughs> And here comes Fetterman pursuing madcap, uh, you know, bat out of hell, uh, <laughs> uh, disregard all orders, we're going to get the savages. And what happened? Well, Crazy Horse led him right down the ravine where like uh, hundreds of uh, warriors were waiting. And they moved in like a swarm of locusts. And I think that they killed every last man in the uh, regiment. The Fetterman. That was called the Fetterman Massacre. One might have lived. I'm not sure. They might have let one live to go back and tell the commanding officer what happened. I think that was the plan. So... Uh, that's how these people worked, okay? That's how Geronimo and Crazy Horse and all these different warriors, they had plans, they had strategic plans. Uh, now the Apache Kid, the Apache Kid was a desperado. He was a, he was as known as a bandit. Uh, an Apache bandit, an Apache uh, bandit, okay, that's what they would have called him back then, Desperado. Sometimes he had short hair, sometimes he'd let his hair grow long, sometimes he would wear native garb, uh, just a loincloth, other times he would dress up like with a, oh, a Navajo hat, maybe a Navajo Bailey hat and black black coat and suit and boots and look just like maybe a, a, a Mexican cowboy, okay, uh, caballero. And blend right in with the people and then uh, just disappear as easily as he came. As much as they would like to pin every murder in Arizona on him, just like they'd like to do that with Geronimo, uh, it's doubtful that he, he really was uh, in a bloodthirsty mood having killed. He Yes, he killed people, uh, but it was mainly because he was being pursued. And if you know the whole story about the Apache kid, it was uh, quite colorful. He was, he was captured as a kid uh, by some blue coats and Al Sieber, who was chief of scouts or head of scouts for uh, the army at that time. And uh, he was an ex extremely uh, good scout, Al Sieber. He was probably as good as they come, almost as good as an Apache, but Apache kid was just a little bit better. He learned from Al, but he had his own natural instincts, and he was a renegade at heart, but he humbled himself enough to work for the scouts uh, to track his own people for a time. And he learned the hard way that he would be double-crossed, and he was, uh, and they set him up for a fall and he took a fall because he got accused of shooting Al Sieber in the foot with a, I think it was a 44. But he didn't really do it. Uh, one of the other people uh, in the crowd that was at that incident, that particular incident, did it. And it was an incident where he had just come back on kind of a revenge thing. And this is one time he did kill. He killed a person that had taken the life of his father and he had just come back and um, 
he just took a vacation from scouting to do that little deed that he had to do. Uh, it was an honor thing, okay. And uh, it was inner, you know, it had to do, it, it was a inter-tribal thing, okay. Which a lot of those things happened back then, okay. Somebody would kill somebody's father or brother or son or something and then, well, they'd have to go kill somebody in sacred retribution of. But anyway, he, did, he, was, uh, he was innocent of the charges that they trumped up against him, the Apache kid, and they sent him off to Alcatraz, which was just being formed and in existence at that time. And uh, he got pardoned. I don't know how he got pardoned, but he got pardoned by the governor and, uh, who looked at the case and decided that it was trumped up looked at his record as a scout and all that good shit. And so he was freed, but he spent some time in San Francisco, learned all kinds of things, uh, probably from the locals there and the Chinese people and the, uh, the women and whatever. He blended in again when he, when he got out of prison, but then he worked his way back to Arizona. And when he got back to Arizona, uh, the authorities there had it in their mind in Al Sieber that they were going to frame him or retry him again. And uh, they did. And it was kind of like a fixed jury, uh, you know, that type of thing, bribing and all that good shit. And really, the Apache kid had done nothing other than be a victim of their hatred. So at this point, it was like, okay, you know, I've had enough of the wide eyes. <laughs> and as they were shipping him off to Yuma Prison, which is the worst place you'd ever want to send an Apache, they just considered it death. They used to put him in little small caves, like with adobe caves with iron bars on them where you could hardly move around and there were snakes and all kinds of shit in there. Uh, and as he was being shipped off on this uh, stagecoach with some other Apaches um, for other various crimes they had done, the other Apaches that is, as they were going up a hill, they couldn't make it up a hill, and they were told to get out and push the st stagecoach up the hill. And at that time, that's when there, you know, a flashpoint happened and one of the Apaches, forget his name, grabbed a gun it just kind of wasted the marshal <laughs> driver of the uh, stagecoach. One was a marshal and one was a, I don't know, uh, an assistant, okay. I think his name was Hunky Dory Holmes or something, some weird name like that. Uh, one guy got shot dead and the other guy, the marshal got shot dead and the other guy uh, got shot through the mouth, went out the back of his neck, he lived. And actually, the Apache kid saved his life because the other Apaches wanted to kill him and he, he said, don't waste your bullets, I think he's gonna die anyway, but he, he was actually just trying to save the guy's life. So from that point on, the Apache kid was hunted and hunted and hunted and that's when he became the super chameleon and that's where he'd appear and disappear and live in the mountains and live like a tracker and live off the land and then come into the white man's community and this and that. Some people happened upon him, he'd let him go. He'd take cattle, he'd make raids, he'd make raids in, into camps and, and take women with him. Most of the time they went on their own accord, it seems, because none of them ever wanted to leave the kid after they were with him. Just like none of the women ever wanted to leave Goyathle or Geronimo when they were with him. Uh, they kind of had a shop to your drop type <laughs> rule the Apaches did, you know, if they did a raid and they found a little Mexican woman they liked it, uh, and they didn't have a wife, they just say, hey you, over here you're coming with me. <laughs> That's how they got wives sometimes. Uh, 
and usually they were more than happy to stay with them for some reason or another uh, they were never really put in bondage they were captured initially but then after they became familiar with the Apache ways and their lifestyle nobody wanted to leave um, very few let's put it that way so here I am waxing on about uh, all these warriors you know and how they lived in their lifestyle and uh, even the women warriors were strong strong spirits and see that's what I don't see today that's what Thunder doesn't see he doesn't see that strong spirit out there uh, the spirit of the brave the spirit of the warrior the the courage up that's what was really meant when when crazy horse said hoka hey it is a good day to die uh, he was that was actually an exhortation to his troops or to his fellow braves that courage up in other words get your courage up uh, forget about death and that's much the same as the code code of Bushido okay with the uh, with the samurai okay they had much in common with that kind of warriorship mentality of courage and basically looking at themselves as if they were already dead so that they wouldn't worry about whether they were going to die kind of a hard concept to embrace maybe but a good one very very good one a very good warrior code okay which shouldn't be embraced uh, just about life in general uh, that's how you should view life you know is that each day is a gift okay now if you have that if you have that attitude like that then you're going to enjoy life more and you're going to enjoy every second that you have in life because this is another gift another day of life and you're not going to take shit from anybody because they what can they do to you if you already consider yourself dead or uh, if you consider that the uh, the worst thing that could happen and you accept it then what what the hell can anybody do to you really So, Geronimo up, people, and Crazy Horse up. Uh, get into that frame of mind, and it fits perfectly with Thunder. What Thunder was talking about before about uh, reacquiring that primordial chi, reacquiring primordial chi that primordial instinct of the noble savage if you will uh, and truly those words might be uh, have more meaning than you realize um, because what would somebody like Geronimo or Crazy Horse or any of those people uh, what use would they have for some of the rules and regulations of society? You know what they did to those kind of people that had no use for those rules? Well, they put them on reservations. But they would have done that anyway because that was the free spirit. That was the spirit of the red man, okay? Uh, we don't take shit. We're a proud people now. Was it was it the kind of proud of like prideful uh, arrogance? No, wasn't that way at all. It was proud to be a people that lived in oneness with the spirit that moves in all things. It was that kind of pride. Okay, uh, proud to be a real person, not a fake person not a cut out pop out uh, white eyes okay 
Now, did they judge people by their skin? Uh, am I saying that Crazy Horse and uh, Geronimo and all those people were racist? No, I think it was just the other way around. Because, um, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you how I reason this out. Geronimo, uh, Geronimo uh, actually met white men early on. In fact, a lot of the natives wet, met, uh, met white men early on, the white eyes. And incidentally, they called them white eyes. It wasn't really a derogatory term. It was just a descriptive term. Because their eyes seem to be whiter than the indigenous person's eyes, which has kind of like a coffee color to it. Uh, that's why they called them white eyes. It could have been just as much just a descriptive term, not a derogatory term. Because there was some, some of the white eyes that they held in affection, and, and even Geronimo met a few surveyors early on that he traded good with, goods with and had a good time with. Shared some, uh, shared a campfire and some coffee and maybe a good cigar or whatever. And uh, had no problem with it. wasn't until it wasn't until that the white eyes or the European man showed their true colors, and not all of them, but a majority of them showed their true colors by labeling people as savage and uh, basically treating them like they had no intelligence when they were like supremely intelligent and spiritual, both of those things. They were medicine men. They were on a spiritual path, the red road. And it just got to be that the wide eyes became a nuisance with their... Uh, way of thinking and they're overrunning the land and that's when they begin to hate the white uh, man because it was not so much a matter of hating a race but hating the way that race acted they just deduce that these these assholes don't know what the hell they're doing that's what they deduce it's like well they don't know what the hell they're doing they're not living in oneness with the land they're destroying everything they're taking our land they're trying to tell us what to do they have their religion that they uh, have but yet they try to force it on us we don't try to force our religion on them the whole deal okay wasn't that that they were bad at all they were good people that were set upon you see that today that's why I say from a tribal point of view, you don't want to come down on people like of different tribes and nations and colors and that type of thing. That's an old tactic that's used by the white eyes, okay? Uh, to try to put people or a description of people or a certain uh, image of people or a certain vibration regarding a certain people, a race, just like they do today with the Middle Eastern people, and I won't even say Islamic or I won't say Muslim because that's a religion. There's a lot of Middle Eastern people that probably don't have any religion except that of spirit, and they're tribal. Let's remember these people are tribal. They don't live the same way that Others do. They have more of a tribal instinct, a tribal fashion. And so the white man is going to use this, the powers to be are going to use this as a, a means of fear. Make one race fear another. Now, didn't they do that with uh, the red man? Of course they did. A savage is could very well be the... the, the uh, the same have the same meaning as terrorist does today savage not not warrior okay 
not uh, indigenous person, not person of people of the land, not tribal person, savage, savage. So let's not fall for that bullshit again with anybody. I mean, what I see should be on this earth, what Thunder sees is tribal unity, okay? Uh, of all mankind, of all races, tribes, and tongues. And that's the way it should be. Um, and even back then it should have been that way if there were skirmishes, and sometimes skirmishes led to unity amongst tribes and an alliance, okay, a true alliance. So that's something to think about, people. History repeating itself in many ways and, and that division of like civilization from let's say tribal people or let's say you don't want to think tribally, you don't want to think in a warrior type fashion, you don't want to think in a free, free spirit type fashion. Geronimo once said, we once were free like the wind, we roamed free like the wind. And that's the way every brave and every uh, warrior feels, should feel. And should we all be warriors? Should we all be tapping into that indigenous spirit? I think so. That's something that we've all let go and so we've be basically become like old women. If you're not thinking in a warrior type fashion, if you're not thinking in a spiritual warrior or a physical warrior type fashion, people get all hung up with this, oh my God, warrior means killing. Well, yes it does. It's a part of it if need be, accept it. Um, can be done with reverence, you know. Not that I'm out saying that you should turn your hand against your brother. What I'm saying is, is that you should not let your brother turn his hand against you. And the blue coats and the white man have a history of not only turning on ethnicity, but on their own people. Let's get this straight. They will sell their own people down the river. It's, it, they will use their own people. It's, it's evident today that they are using their own people. Civilization in general, mankind in general, are being used as slaves to just like when they tried to subjugate the Apache warrior hunter-gatherer and put him in a cornfield and make farmers out of him. Well, some of them weren't just cut out to be farmers. Did they farm and did they get their own food before the white man came? Hell yes, they did. They gathered the bounty of nature they were into the bounty of nature and they considered it given to them by their gods, their fire gods, their water gods, their supreme god, their great spirit, who they had much reverence for and danced around a fire for and they had the Apache, have, you know, they have the gone dancers and they do the fire dance for the mountain spirits This is how people should be thinking. This is like, if you don't know this stuff, learn from thunder. Think about these things. That's why I'm here. I talk about world affairs and I talk about what's going on in the planet, but what you really have to realize is what's going on with you. How are you relating and what is your relationship like with the planet? What is your relationship like with the ancestral primordial chi of the 
great warriors like Goyathle and Crazy Horse and Chief Joseph and Sitting Bull and the list goes on and on and on. Hell, there might be warriors out there that we don't even know about that were just as great as any of those. Those just happen to make a name for themselves and go down in legend. But are you a warrior? Could you go down as a legend? Or do you just fit into the mold that they try to put you in? Because if you do, you're not living life. You're not enjoying life. You're not partaking of the spirit that moves in all things. Does your heart get warmed when I talk about these stories? Does, does it set up a resonance? See, that's a key word that keeps coming to me, resonance. Okay, do you resonate with some of the things I talk about, does it resonate with you? Does it activate your spirit? Does it move your heart? Does it move your soul to realize that something has been lost along the way? Maybe. Uh, if it does, then there's hope for you. Uh, that's all I can say is that if this resonates with you, if you like to hear these stories about people and places and incidents, then it, it's, uh, you can look at it as a kindred resonance to yours, to your resonance and your frequency. Uh, and you can attune to the resonance of the ancient, ancient spiritual traditions. We try to do that in the Campfire Council, um, which you can join by going to the link below, but I'm not out here to gain membership. It's just that a lot of people that are in the council think like I do. Uh, they reflect on some of the same things that I reflect on. Hopefully. Would be nice. Uh, so these are the kind of things you want to think about as the seasons approach. You know, I think about the seasons and all these celebrations that the wide eyes have instituted, like Thanksgiving and Christmas and uh, if you only knew about the celebration of life that the indigenous people had every day, not just on certain days, all year, it was ritualistic to welcome all seasons and all every day and do a sunrise ceremony every morning. It wasn't just, hey, we're going to make this day Thanksgiving. Man, they were thankful every friggin' day. There wasn't a meal that went by where they weren't thankful and it wasn't a Thanksgiving. That's what they tried to teach the white man, only he just kind of took it and uh, manipulated it into his own uh, religion in his own way. And then condemned the others that, you know, that, that taught him this way. <laughs> Talk about hypocrisy, huh? So, I really want you to think about the true legendary noble warriors of the indigenous people of this land, the ones that discovered this land, the ones that propagated and, and populated this land way, way before the European man ever showed up. Whole civilizations, baby. Whole civilizations of a different uh, vibe for every tribe 
on this land, on this beautiful Turtle Island, which has now been renamed to America. Um, well, I think I got my message across today. I kind of just felt like I wanted to talk and tell some stories. Uh, I could go on and on and on here all day about the stories of the great ones. Uh, if you don't know, if you don't know these stories, you might want to look into a history of Crazy Horse or a history of the Lakota people or a history of the Apache people or uh, the different tribal factions and the different bands of Apaches and the different bands of warriors and the different uh, different mindsets they had and uh, it all revolved around freedom and, and, and being one with the spirit that moves in all things. So you just can't you just can't say, oh, I like Indians or whatever. I mean, you, you, have to, uh, you have to become a spiritual Indian. If you don't have the blood in you, it's okay. You could have been uh, lived three, four, five lifetimes as an indigenous person. And you probably did, so you need to tap into that. And you need to tap into the spirit of that doesn't matter what your skin color is as long as you go tribal. Tribal unity, people. And even the white eyes are a tribe. The Hopi spelled it out plain, simple, and clear. There's the white tribe, the red tribe, the black tribe, the yellow tribe, the in between tribes of those colors, uh, intermingling. Most people, uh, a lot of people have uh, indigenous blood in them and they don't even know, but again, it doesn't matter. It's where your heart is. Where is your heart? Where is your heart? It's a plain, simple question that deserves an answer. Where is your heart? Is it with a, a type of indigenous, indigenous ethnicity that surrounds you or maybe part of your DNA or should I talk to Mexicans sometimes that are half Indian and they don't even know it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have to tell them, you know you're half Indian, right? And they go, what? That's how, that's the consciousness of, of man. I mean, they, they're not even aware. You should get into your family tree. I don't care what it is. It could be Nordic and it could be, it could have some deep, deep tribal roots. Everybody should get into their ancestry and tap into that. And you can tap into it in this life and you can tap into it in the, from the spiritual realm like shamans do on a daily basis. When I come up with these topics, it's not by sheer chance, it's by inspiration from spiritual ancestral uh, forces. That uh, lead me down a path to uh, regenerate that energy and that feeling, okay, through my words, through my warrior words, to regenerate that feeling in all of you and myself. Uh, as I speak of these people, they become alive. You might sit around in council with uh, the silent eaters. What's the silent eaters, you say? Well, here comes another story. <clears throat> the silent eaters were a society, and there were many, many societies, secret societies, amongst all tribes. And one of the, one of the secret societies was the silent eaters, which is a warrior society of the Sioux, 
which crazy horse and <clears throat> excuse me crazy horse and sitting bull <clears throat> where's my water crazy horse and sitting bull all belong to these uh, societies and they would sit in council in a strange way they were called the silent eaters because they would sit around and partake of the bounty offered to them by Mother Earth of food and uh, game and whatever they could acquire for their meal when they would sit around and they would eat in silence and they would almost commune on a spiritual level not almost they would commune on a spiritual level with just their energy they were all warriors and they were all sitting around within a tribal realm a society within a tribal realm that were watchers or watchmen or guardians of the rest of the tribe and made decisions and these people in this particular society were called silent eaters now does that mean that they didn't say a word to each other well no because they did and they had counsel and the council was like it wasn't a lot of chatter it was very few words with each other regarding the, the well-being of their tribe and what needed to be done and decisions were made that affected the whole group or the whole tribe and these people were these silent eaters were honored by the tribe and there were many secret societies both in Cheyenne and Sioux and the Lakota each tribe had its secret society even the Hopi had many many secret societies regarding all kinds of things movement of energy welfare of the tribe uh, communing with the nature spirits to provide food and rain and so these societies have, were, were far deeper than you can even imagine. Uh, they talked about things and they did ritual and they summoned spirit that moves in all things and the guardian spirits and whatever they needed to, to uh, have their visions and have their uh, tribe be, uh, be, be in, a, in a safe position as it moved through the realms of this uh, this reality and all these people were very I can't I can't emphasize enough that it's a s form of spirituality that most will never understand in a lifetime and their relationships with their women and others in the community most people would not understand in a lifetime so you know in order to scratch the surface you have to dig a little so i hope that i have provided a little bit to you today concerning that mode of life and how free that life is how free that that kind of thought is whether you're in a city or wherever you're at you can tap into it I love telling stories and I hope you enjoyed the this little bit of uh, nostalgia and uh, journey into uh, areas that you might not be familiar with and I'll try to make you more familiar with as I move along here through this journey we call life I'll leave it there uh, that means from the one eye of the heart. This is thunder. I'm out of here. <laughs>